five years ago, a 3D printing YouTuber started sessions to fix and diagnose viewers' printing troubles. If you have a problem, if no one else can help, and if you can find him, maybe you can hire the 3D Senpai. So let's try this again. A couple of days ago, I asked on YouTube and Twitter for you guys to send me photos of your 3D printing issues that I should have a look at. And you all sent in tons of stuff with hashtag 3D Senpai. So sorry if I can cover it all. I've picked out a couple of issues where mostly I want to show you the process of identifying and diagnosing where an issue is coming from so that you can start looking in the right spots too. We've got three cases I want to take a look at. So let's get started right after a message from today's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is an interactive learning platform focusing on teaching you science and technology. In today's day and age, it is more important than ever to understand how the world around us works and how things relate and interact. I really enjoy learning by doing and Brilliant nicely caters to that by guiding you through their lessons with easy to follow examples that let you experiment with the interrelations of the subject you're learning about. And if you struggle with the concept, they always provide detailed step-by-step -step solutions. Brilliant's courses are made for a whole range of skill levels and fields you want to learn about. So whether you want to brush up your skills on understanding basic statistics, learn about space travel physics, or are trying to get started with computer programming or even neural networks, they've got the right course for you. Brilliant's goal is to help boost your creative problem-solving skills for the real world, and you can get started for free at the link in the video description below. Plus, if you decide to sign up for an annual membership, the first 200 people will get an extra 20% off. Thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Okay, first one, and this is a classic. Jakob Schüler is tweeting, weird bumps in my auto wall. Happening with all filaments I've tried, not quite sure. Happening with Cura and Prusa Slicer. I think I just forgot to turn on specific setting. There's some important information in there already, but let's check out what we're seeing first. The most obvious thing is that there are these little blobs or zits on vertical surfaces. They're pretty sparse, and looking at the backside here, I guess they're at most one per layer. The light is also catching on a longer streak that looks like a bit of overextrusion along each layer, always towards the right or anti-clockwise around the part from each blob. He's saying it's not isolated to a specific filament, and from what we can see, it also doesn't look like we've got anything that is aligned with the movement axes of the printer in X or Y. Maybe a bit of bed bounds in Z, but that's a different topic. So we can rule out issues on the motion system, as well as issues stemming from bubbles or moisture pockets in the specific filament he's using. We're left with the way the filament is deposited, so slices settings that affect the extruder and hotend, and of course, that hardware itself too. I'm fairly sure that these blobs align with the start of the extrusion path of the outside shell, when the printer moves from printing the inner shells to the outermost one. Typically, the inner shells are being printed faster than the outside one, because you care less about surface finish and mechanical ringing when you're adding an extra shell towards the outside anyway. But what can and does happen is that because you're printing faster, you've also got more pressure built up in the hot end from the faster filament feed, and when the printer suddenly goes to the slower outside shell, that pressure doesn't immediately disappear when the extruder goes to its lower feed rate, but instead the hot end continues spewing out filament at that original rate for a bit, and then slowly tapers off to the slower rate. Hence, the initial blob and the overextrusion. So what can you do? Many modern printers have pressure advance enabled and tuned in their firmware, which tries to counteract that laziness in the hot end flow characteristics. But it is tuned specifically for the setup in its factory state, so with a different nozzle or hot end, or with a worn out or loose filament path like I've discovered uh, in one of my Mark III's recently, it's not going to work that well anymore. So check that there's nothing worn out, um, but if your printer does not use pressure advance or a similar technique, simply setting the feed rates for the inner and outer perimeters to the same value should take care of the issues pretty well too. Sure, having every bit of speed tuned to the max for every bit of the print sounds nice, but for maximum consistency and quality, going slow and keeping the hot end and extruder at a constant steady state is usually the safer bet. Maustamtura is tweeting a photo and pointing out X-shaped holes on an old Ultimaker. This is a fairly obvious one, especially on an old and worn Ultimaker, but let's go through the steps to try and do this methodically. So we're only seeing the print from the top, which in this case is fine, but that means extrusion and Z-axis problems are something we're not really going to be able to look at. But we can see what Maustamtura is pointing out. All the holes that 
I assume should be round, instead are kind of an oval tilted shape. They are taller than they are wide. The same with the hexagons in the middle here. Uh, they seem to be squished in the x direction, and if you look closely we can also see that the sides of the hexagons also have different lengths. The top left side is significantly shorter than the top right one. And lastly, the infill and the inner perimeters are also having trouble fully touching the outside perimeters. Of course, prints like these are barely usable, but this is a fairly easy one to diagnose. It's backlash, specifically on the x-axis and probably some of the y-axis too. The automakers have fairly complex mechanics, with lots of pulleys, belts and chances for stuff to become loose. The Automaker 3 that I have uh, essentially still uses the same motion system as the very first ones, and when one of these linear guides starts to bind or wear out, when a pulley comes loose or when a belt stretches too much, you're essentially creating a situation where the stepper motor driving the axis will move correctly, but the actual nozzle position will significantly lag behind and always be off by that amount of backlash. So checking that all the grub screws on the pulleys are tight, making sure none of the belts have any slack, and checking the bushings for wear and binding issues should be the first order of business. It also looks like there might be a bit of under extrusion going on. Uh, the old automaker extruders weren't the best and they come from a time when tuning machine to under extrude a bit for better print quality was pretty common. But that's something that should only be tuned in once the backlash is sorted out. Domenico Lamberti, longtime channel viewer and supporter, is asking about a problem with his Prusa Mini Plus in PTG. The first layer was okay, the first few layers were actually, but on one side it bubbled up like this, almost like that side of my bed was minutely lower. And this one's interesting because there are a few things adding together here. When you look at the photo, the first thing you're going to see is what looks like two or three large holes on the side. But that's actually just the result of two problems much earlier on. Domenico is pointing out that to him it looks like that corner of the bed is lower. I'm going to stick to saying the nozzle is closer or further away from the bed, that is a bit less ambiguous. And if you look closely at what the first layer looks like, there is actually a very familiar pattern that's visible. That intermittent folding motion where each line is squeezed down so wide that the next one actually rides over the previous one and doesn't end up making contact with the bed at all. That's the pattern you get, and it's not a good way to get better bed adhesion. You often also get a similar pattern when the bed surface is contaminated with fingerprints or grease. So to fix that, what I'd recommend is actually to raise the distance between the nozzle and the bed, and then the good old trick, if adhesion is a problem, go with a wider and a thicker first layer and turn down the speed for that. That gives your printer a much better chance of squeezing that first layer against the bed and getting adhesion, even if there are imperfections in how well the bed is adjusted. And then the second thing I'm seeing is a problem with the model, and that is that it looks like it contains an unprintable overhang right there against the bed. This just isn't printable as is, and especially on the first layer, you're also fighting against uh, the heat from the bed that is keeping that freshly printed layer from cooling off and hardening in time, meaning it's actually more likely to curl up and cause issues further up the print, which is what I think we're seeing here. So for that, a good workaround is, instead of using those full fillets, using fake fillets, which are a combination of a 45 degree chamfer and a fillet rounding over the edge towards the top. This is much more printable than a full fillet, and if the chamfer edge is too sharp, you can scrape over it with a knife and create a smoother transition that way. Alternatively, of course, you can use a full raft and support material, but that usually isn't the way you want to go. Now, of course, all these tips and knowing what certain failure modes look like, for me, kind of built on having seen almost every failure mode there is on these 3D printers. If you don't have that amount of experience, it can really help to just watch your 3D printer as it's printing. You're going to learn what it looks and sounds like when it's working normally, and once it deviates from that, you can usually just watch the problem unfold right in front of your eyes. So for the folks whose print problems I talked about, I hope I was able to help you. For everyone else, keep an eye out for the next 3D Senpai if you've got printer problems too. But in either case, I hope you learned something. If you did, give the video a thumbs up, uh, get subscribed if you don't want to miss the next one. And if you really dig what I'm doing here, uh, consider supporting the channel through Patreon or YouTube memberships. Thanks for watching, keep on making, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.